I'm sure most of you are aware of the statement, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. Basically what they're talking about are transactions that you've had with credibility. Credibility is the fundamental building block that allows civilized society to operate. Think about how many credibility transactions you participate in on a daily basis. If you work someplace, uh, when you ask a customer uh, if you can help them, uh, your credibility is basically you know, based on the fact that, that you are an employee of that organization. If you're an HR manager, uh, you make credibility assessments based on whether or not uh, you think someone is credible enough to work for you. Uh, if you are uh, at a place of business and you're going to have an auto mechanic repair uh, your vehicle, that is a credibility transaction. You are looking at that auto mechanic and you're trying to get a feel for whether or not you think that that person is qualified to work on your automobile. We make these credibility assessments all the time. Uh, we make them about our friends, our coworkers. We make them about our spouses and our girlfriends and boyfriends. Uh, we make them about all sorts of folks that we interact with on a regular basis. These things are called credibility transactions. Public speaking is built on two fundamental building blocks. The first of which are the factors of keeping and gaining attention that we've previously discussed. The second of which is credibility. Your credibility as a public speaker is integral to the audience accepting your message and to taking you seriously. So let's explore this very simple yet simultaneously very complex concept of credibility. To begin with, let's uh, look at a dictionary definition from dictionary.com. Credibility. Capable of being believed. Believable. A credible statement. Second entry. Worthy of belief or confidence. Trustworthy. Uh, I always think that it's funny uh, when someone comes to my office and they says, say, uh, well, I've, I've had a lot of problems logging on to the online classroom and I haven't been able to do uh, my homework and, you know, there's just been a whole lot of issues. I've had some, you know, stuff going on, you know, personally. And I always uh, kind of look at them and say, wow, your, uh, your story is incredible. And they say, oh, okay, well, thanks, man. I appreciate that. And I think that there's a common misconception in American society about what uh, credibility incredible means. Uh, I think that most people think that the uh, commonly associated uh, you know, meaning is uh, something is awesome or something is great. Uh, more to the point, uh, incredible means it's incapable of being believed or not believable. Uh, so, you know, when you go race cars at Incredible Pizza, uh, really the, the more appropriate and, uh, and less elegant title uh, would be unbelievable pizza or not capable of being believed pizza. So uh, that's what incredible means. Incredible just means I don't believe it. So credibility uh, is, is an antonym of that, uh, and it means capable of being believed. Tons of educational research has shown a link between perceptions of speech effectiveness and credibility. In other words, if you speak well, uh, chances are good people think that you are a credible person. And if you do a good job developing your credibility, uh, most audiences think that the uh, speech went very well. So have uh, here a couple of uh, examples of some speakers, uh, one of which uh, is a nerd, the other of which is uh, the complete diametrical opposite of that, and that is uh, the Dos Equis pitch guy, the most interesting man in the world. Um, as you might imagine, if you were to hear these two gentlemen speak, you would have radically different impressions about uh, them based on uh, a number of different factors. Uh, their competence, their character, and their charisma. Uh, whereas you might uh, think that uh, both of them are, you know, kind of straight shooting guys, uh, certainly the, the Dos Equis pitch man, the most interesting man in the world, would, would have the leg up when it comes to charisma. However, if uh, the two of them were to give you a speech about uh, repairing uh, the motherboard uh, of a computer, you would probably think that the gentleman to the left was more qualified uh, to discuss that topic. So. Uh, there's, a, there's a link between uh, those three things, competence, character, and charisma, and uh, those three things all interplay with and dance around the topic that is being discussed. And you may think someone is very qualified to talk about a particular subject, but someone is unqualified to talk about another subject. And you may think that they have a lot of uh, character or trustworthiness on a particular subject, whereas you may think that their trustworthiness is very limited on, a, on another subject. So 
Um, those three variables, confidence, character, and charisma, basically make up credibility. Before we move any further, we should observe that credibility is not something tangible. Credibility is not something that I can send you to the student union to purchase a can of. Uh, I couldn't list under the required materials for this class a can of credibility to be used when giving addresses in public. Uh, as much as I would like to, uh, that's just not simply something you know that's possible because credibility is not a tangible object. It's intangible and it is perceptual. It's in the mind of the audience members who are hearing a speech. And in some circumstances, a speaker may be credible and in other circumstances, a speaker may not be credible. Uh, it's perceptual and it's situational. And those are two huge uh, factors that influence credibility that you should be aware of. It's perceptual and it's situational. The three primary components of credibility, we'll discuss these, uh, are character, charisma, and competence. And uh, you see here that there's an overlap of all three of those circles, and uh, that is uh, the rare uh, instance in which a, a speaker has both character and charisma and competence. Uh, you will hear me use the term ethos uh, to, or ethos to discuss uh, credibility. Uh, ethos and credibility are pretty much interchangeable. Uh, your character has to do with your trustworthiness and whether or not you are someone who is telling the truth. Uh, obviously, we're all faced with situations all the time where someone knows the truth but is not necessarily reporting the truth. Uh, your competence deals with uh, your ability to produce the truth. Do you know enough? Do you have enough experience? Do you have the credentials? Do you have the education? And do you have the mental acumen to produce the truth? Uh, and that's what competence is. And then finally, your charisma is likability. It's uh, does the audience find you attractive? Does the audience uh, think that you are a speaker that they would all like to be like? Uh, are you cool? Uh, do you you know say things that make the audience uh, want to uh, do as you do and believe as you do? And uh, do you you know come off as someone that the audience members would like to emulate, or do you come off as someone who is less charismatic, possibly someone who's very monotone? Uh, someone who isn't very cool and someone who uh, isn't really uh, someone that the audience wants to be like. Those are the three primary components of credibility and there's some other things that kind of you know impact it here and there but if you'll just remember those three things, character, competence, and charisma, uh, you should uh, be able to safeguard against losing your credibility in the future. Now that we know what those three primary components of credibility are, let's look at a few other things that influence uh, credibility. And first, let's talk about competence. Competence is essentially your credentials uh, and whether or not you are considered to be a person who is knowledgeable about a particular topic. And I chose uh, the nurse here or uh, possibly the physician here uh, because she uh, has a character. She has, uh, I'm sorry, she has competence. You, you look at her and she looks comfortable uh, in her uniform. She's got the stethoscope, which is a further kind of emblem of her uh, credentials. Uh, you know, even though you can purchase a stethoscope relatively cheaply and inexpensively online, um, it's not something that most people who aren't uh, either a medical professional, you know, or, or a nurse or a doctor or something like that have uh, in, in everyday circumstances. So the stethoscope is kind of an emblem of her credentials. Uh, so are the scrubs. It's an everyday uniform. It communicates to you that she has studied someplace and that she's received special uh, you know, education in a particular topic and that she has reached a level of expertise and that she is someone that should be taken seriously whenever she's discussing uh, items that pertain to the medical field. So uh, those are your credentials. Your credentials center around things like your occupation, your experience, your education. Uh, do you have uh, experience in this field? Are you someone who's employed in this field? And did you study a lot to learn about this particular topic? Those are all things that uh, credentials kind of you know uh, circulate around. And if you look at the root of credentials, you'll see that it's also very similar to credibility. Right? Uh, both of them kind of center around that cred part. And uh, that just means, you know, capable of being believed. So um, we, we equate and we hold those two things to be synonymous. If you have credentials, then you are credible. And, uh, you know, a, a really good example of that, kind of a humorous example of that, is the movie uh, A Knight's Tale, uh, where uh, 
the late Heath Ledger uh, plays a knight uh, who has these patents of nobility forged for him. And uh, in the forging of those patents of nobility, uh, he basically develops credentials for himself. And those credentials make him someone who is capable of being believed uh, at court, someone who's capable of being believed uh, when they say that they are a prince or th that they are you know, an heir to the throne of, of Gilderland or uh, Germany or, or wherever he purports to be from uh, in the movie. Those are credentials. Non-fluencies also influence perceptions of competence. And uh, the graphic that I chose here uh, was someone who is tongue-tied. Uh, poor message delivery can decrease competence assessments. And if uh, someone is really tongue-tied or kind of looking for the next word or doesn't know what they want to say, oftentimes we will perceive that person to be a person who is not very credible, uh, a person who lacks familiarity uh, with what they uh, want to communicate. And uh, some other forms of non-fluencies are vocal pauses, these long, you know, kind of drawn-out pauses between words or phrases when a speaker should be speaking but instead is silent. The repetition of words or phrases. Many of you will have little filler phrases that you use, you know, whenever you get excited or whenever you don't know what you want to say next. So if your speech is, is kind of peppered with phrases like, well, to the extent, or therefore, or... Uh, you know, things like that. Those are repetition of words or phrases. Those are little pet phrases that make you feel more comfortable whenever you don't really know what you want to say next. Also, corrections uh, of slips of the tongue. Uh, if you're making a lot of slips of the tongue and you're making a lot of verbal errors, uh, oftentimes audiences equate that uh, with a speaker who is not very familiar with their message and uh, who needs to practice their message or, or needs to revamp their message uh, in a very significant way because they're not familiar with what they want to communicate. Finally, articulation difficulties. Uh, and in particular, this is true of scientific topics. If you are talking about a disease, uh, say for instance in your informative speech, and you're constantly and consistently mispronouncing that disease, or you're mispronouncing other things that have to do with that particular topic, uh, oftentimes audiences will pick up on those misperceptions and uh, or on those uh, misarticulation uh, and uh, and pick up on those difficulties and they will negatively uh, relate your competency based on those articulation difficulties. For instance, uh, I listened to a speaker and she was giving a, a, a speech, a, a discussion, a training session about how to produce podcasts and uh, she kept on referring to this computer uh, program as uh, Audacity, Audacity, A-U-D-I-C-I-T-Y. And uh, she just kept referring to it as Audacity over and over and over again. And of course the word is Audacity. And uh, it's kind of a, you know, it's a, it's a podcasting platform. Those of you who are familiar with uh, Barack Obama's autobiography know that his first, you know, writing uh, was a book called The Audacity of Hope. And it's just about how, you know, speaking, uh, you know, and, and being hopeful, you know, is, is an act of courage. And, uh, you know, you have to be audacious uh, to be, you know, uh, hopeful. Um, I, uh, I thought about, you know, her speech and how consistently and how often she mispronounced this word. And, I mean, seriously, in the course of an hour, she must have mispronounced this word about, you know, 40 or 50 times, you know, about once a minute. And uh, it, was, it was just completely grated on my nerves. And uh, I, uh, I sent an email to a colleague who had listened to the presentation and said, yeah, you know, uh, I, I'm thinking about getting the ADA and then put a space in between it, and then City of Hope, you know, the autobiography of uh, Barack Obama. And, uh, of course, sent that to, you know, one of my good friends who is a Republican, and um, they had listened to the presentation as well, and they thought that that was one of the more funny things that they had ever heard. Uh, because it was sort of a, you know, a fusion of, of, a, of a quib about politics and about this uh, speaker who had had these horrible articulation difficulties that the two of us had both uh, had, had both. Uh, set through the presentation of So anytime you have articulation difficulties and you're consistently mispronouncing a word, that can decrease the audience's credibility assessment of you as a speaker. The next thing that I'd like to talk to you about is your speaking rate and uh, levels uh, at which audiences perceive uh, your speakers as being competent. Uh, we have a not-so-credible speaking rate of somewhere around uh, 0 to 90 words per minute. And then we have uh, a somewhat more credible speaking rate of 91 uh, to 130 words a minute, 
audiences really start to think that someone is credible at around the 131 to 160 words per minute, and that's typically the average rate of speech at which most conversations occur. Uh, however, we really tend to look at people who speak in the 161 to 190 category as being incredibly uh, competent, and people who are you know, some of the more competent communicators communicate at that higher level of, of speech rate. And the reason that we think that they're more competent is because they're not searching for the next word. They're obviously you know, very mentally uh, acute because they're capable of constructing their speech very quickly. And that typically tends to lend towards perceptions of uh, enhanced credibility. And for the most part, uh, some of the greatest speeches of all times have been speeches that occurred in that 161 to 190 uh, range. Uh, the John F. Kennedy asked not what you uh, ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country speech happened at the 161 to 190 rate. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech at the 161 to 190 rate. Uh, Ronald Reagan's uh, speech where uh, he consoled the nation upon the event of the Challenger accident happened at that 161 to 190 rate. And uh, the 2004 Democratic keynote address at the Democratic National Convention uh, who was, which was given by uh, then State Senator Barack Obama, uh, was also at that 161 to 190 rate. And for the most part, speeches around that level tend to be considered to be uh, very credible. Uh, one of the uh, problems that uh, former President Bush had was uh, that he typically spoke in that uh, under 90 to 130 words per minute range. And uh, lots of pundits, lots of uh, public speaking analysts have said that that is one of the things that contributed to folks not thinking that he was a very uh, credible public speaker and hence by extension was not necessarily a very credible president uh, because of his his speech non-fluencies and because of his speaking rate. So a decreased rate signals a lack of familiarity. Conversely, when someone gets over the 200 words per minute mark, we tend to think of them as being very fast talking and someone who is not to be trusted uh, because they uh, are a little too slick. And many of you have, have heard the guy at the end of the car commercial, you know, who says, you know, offer not valid in Minnesota, not valid, you know, on days when the moon is full, you know, and, uh, you know, not valid on trade-ins. Trade-in value, you know, will be added to the end of the loan. Uh, all of those things, those kind of disclaimers at the end of things, those also tend to uh, decrease your credibility because you're you know, throwing in a lot of stuff really quickly there at the end. It's over 200 words a minute, and those are things that automatically kind of signal to the audience, this person's talking really fast because they probably have something to hide. I don't think I'm going to pay a whole lot of attention to them. Also impacting credibility are tr is, is trustworthiness, and, and that includes the citation of evidence. Uh, speakers who cite evidence are perceived as more credible than those that don't. And, you know, you think about that. Um, when you hear someone say, well, I was reading on Yahoo News, uh, that automatically lends credibility to what they're fixing to say because they have researched this. It's from an external source. It's not just them sharing life wisdom with you. It's not just kind of their own personal perception that's been tainted by, you know, whatever. Uh, it is from an objective source. Sometimes, though, when you quote uh, material, uh, the, the evidence is, is credible, and sometimes when you quote material with certain audiences, uh, that evidence is not credible. So it really kind of depends on who you're citing and who you're speaking to as to whether or not that evidence actually increases or decreases perceptions of the audience's, uh, of, of your trustworthiness on the part of the audience. So be careful who you cite. Make sure that you cite evidence that's going to be acceptable to your audience. If you cite evidence that's not considered to be credible by your audience, then it can actually decrease your credibility. Trustworthiness also uh, has to do with the position that's advocated, and audiences trust speakers who advocate a position that's similar to their own. And this has to do with the speaker's message and uh, whether or not it is within or without uh, the audience's latitude of acceptance. And when a speaker uh, advocate something that the audience already accepts, that speaker tends to have more credibility. If the speaker's message is uh, not within the audience's latitude of acceptance and is rather in their latitude of rejection, then that speaker will automatically be at an initial credibility deficit. That deficit can be overcome with deliberate attempts to bolster credibility and with the citation of evidence sources and things like that. But when you are advocating a message that you know that your audience is automatically hostile to, you've got to be really careful about that because it can lead to these perceptions that you're not to be trusted. 
And here we have a graphic that explains uh, this whole latitude of acceptance, latitude of rejection. Uh, let's say, for instance, we're evaluating the issue of single-payer universal health insurance, and you, you may have someone who, in that particular uh, instance, has this latitude of rejection, I will not uh, evaluate any policies based on, on single-payer universal health insurance, uh, and you may have someone else who's you know, got a latitude of acceptance for that. You hear a speech, you hear a message, and it falls uh, somewhere within that latitude of acceptance with regard to that particular topic. So that latitude of acceptance, latitude of rejection, uh, is just kind of a, a continuum uh, that you know the audience members automatically have with regard to, to certain issues. We have here a graphic uh, of uh, two people holding hands. And uh, trustworthiness also has to deal with kind of holding hands and uh, metaphorically speaking, of course, and uh, whether or not you'd like someone. And uh, when you were a child, you know, the, uh, the, the, uh, when you were a young adult, a young adolescent uh, engaged in your first romantic relationship, uh, you would communicate liking with someone else by holding hands. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I chose that as the graphic for uh, this particular segment. Uh, Liking boosts judgments of the speaker's trustworthiness. So if they think that you're cool, if they think that you are a speaker who's worthy of being listened to, if the audience wants to emulate you and wants to be like you, uh, then that usually boosts judgments of a speaker's trustworthiness. Liking takes on a variety of forms. It can be intellectual, spiritual, attitudinal, physical, or sexual. So around any one of those five different uh, attributes, the, the audience may identify with you and decide that they like you in any one of those five different ways. Uh, liking enhances perceptions of trustworthiness, but not necessarily perceptions of competence. So they may like you, they may think that you're, that you're uh, someone that they would like to be like, they may uh, be attracted to you, uh, they may you know, view you as a kindred spirit, that means that they're going to trust you, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they think that you have credentials. It doesn't necessarily mean that they think that you have uh, knowledge or experience or education or any of the or occupational you know kind of association. So it doesn't boost those perceptions of competence, but it does boost perceptions of trustworthiness. Also related to trustworthiness is humor. If I can make you laugh, uh, then chances are good you're going to find me trustworthy. Uh, humor increases perceptions of liking and therefore impacts trustworthiness. However, bad humor can decrease your credibility. And as we stated when we talked about the factors of keeping and getting attention, if the audience perceives you as someone who is not very funny, then oftentimes that can decrease the credibility that you have with the audience as well. So uh, be aware of that. Understand that bad humor or that not having humor is something that can decrease your credibility uh, with the audience as well. And uh, finally, with regard to trustworthiness, let's talk about lying. Number one rule of public speaking. Number one golden rule of public speaking is never lie to the audience. If you lie to the audience, even just once, your credibility is, is perpetually stained. If the audience finds out that you lied to them, you will never, ever get your credibility back. And uh, the credibility that you have with the audience is... Like I said, one of the most important things that you have as a public speaker. You've got to embrace your credibility. You've got to cultivate it. You've got to actively try to make the audience think that you're credible to talk about uh, whatever topic it is that you're discussing. So uh, your credibility is a very fragile thing. And uh, you should not just play fast and loose with it. You should understand that the most important asset that you have uh, going out in front of that audience, or indeed in front of any audience, is your credibility. So safeguard it, take care of it, make sure that it's not damaged. Finally, tell the truth. Uh, you want to make sure that you're telling the truth to the audience at all times. Uh, your inability to tell the truth is going to really damage you with the audience. Uh, it is rarely the actual deed that is unforgivable, but it is the lie that you tell about the deed that gets you in trouble with the audience that gets you in trouble in life. So it's not the thing that you did, but it's the cover-up about the thing that you did that usually gets you in the most trouble. So when, when you're you know, caught in that uh, situation, uh, it's much better to tell the truth and come clean, at least from a public speaking standpoint. What is credibility? Well, credibility, as we said, is perceptual and it's situational. Let's talk about perceptual. 
Uh, credibility, just like the truth, depends on your perspective or your vantage point. And there was a really great movie a couple of years ago. had a very all-star uh, cast. It had Dennis Quaid, Matthew Fox, Forrest Whitaker, Sigourney Weaver, and William Hurt, uh, all uh, in the same film. And uh, it, was, it was a great film because it's told in these little, you know, 14 or 15 minute vignettes uh, from these different points of view. And uh, even though it is one truth, you get to see a different part of the truth each time. Uh, and it's kind of perceptual from, you know, those eight different vantage points. And it explores all eight of those different vantage points over the course of the film. And uh, really, really a great example of how where you're standing uh, in the room dictates what you see, and uh, where you're standing uh, dictates whether or not you feel like that speaker was credible or not. Uh, someone may hear one speech and view that person to be incredibly competent. Another person who's in that audience may hear that same exact speech and may you know, think, well, that person doesn't have any more credentials than me, and I disagree with them and they uh, advocated something that I don't agree with that was controversial, hence uh, I don't think that that person uh, was competent, I don't think that that person has credibility. Uh, you may present yourself as yourself uh, in a speech and uh, you know half of the audience may think that you're perceptually very cool, uh, a person that they would like to be like, a person that they like, and uh, you're likable, therefore you're trustworthy. However, the other half of the audience may, may think, gosh, that person is you know, really stuck on themselves, they're very pompous, I don't like them, and hence, because I think that they're arrogant, I don't have a very high uh, perception of their trustworthiness. So, uh, you know, as many different people as there are in the room, that's how many perspectives there are going to be on you know, what is said uh, during that speech. So understand that your competence is perceptual and it's all based exclusively in the domain of the audience, and uh, the audience will be the sole determiner as to whether or not you are actually credible or not. An example uh, may help you uh, to further understand what I'm talking about in terms of perception. Uh, imagine that you're the human resources manager for a local business that employs 1,800 employees. You're a senior level member of the management executive team, and you are often aware of information that others in the company are not. You know that your CEO has left town on a business trip to New York City. Upon the CEO's return, she calls a company-wide meeting for later that day. As soon as the meeting is announced, you and the senior vice president of operations are called into the CEO's office. The CEO says, I just got back from New York where I met with our creditors. Gentlemen, things did not go well. We have enough cash on hand to make payroll and our operating expenses for another six months. Unless the economy turns around dramatically, we're going to have to lay off 1,200 employees. That is a 66% decrease in our payroll expenditure. Combined with other cost savings that I'll be announcing later today, that should give us enough operating capital to survive for an additional 18 months without any changes to any other parts of our business operations. I need a list of names from HR by Monday about who those 1,200 soon-to-be-terminated employees will be. I won't be announcing any layoffs before they happen. The terminations will start in two weeks. We have two phases. The phases will be separated by four weeks. The first phase should include 700 newly hired or redundant employees. The interim period, we will train all employees in multiple job functions to ensure the smooth flow of operations without additional staffing. Then, after we've shared that mind institutional knowledge and shared those skills, we'll downsize the redundant workforce and produce a capital savings. Gentlemen, you are to tell no one about this. You are the only two who know. If I find out that either of you told anyone, and I mean anyone, your names will be on that list too. The CEO dismisses you from her office, and 20 minutes later, the CEO is in your company-wide meeting hall, and she states that although times are tough, the company will be rolling up its sleeves and cutting benefits, travel, and capital improvements to minimize costs. She reiterates several times that no one will be downsized. The entire workforce is elated to hear her news. One employee remarks to you, Wow, that's great news. With the baby coming, I don't know what my family would do if I lost this job. My wife has already been downsized, and we just bought a house, and we're thinking about buying another car. Without this job, we'd be lost. You're sick to your stomach, and you return to your office to begin making a list of 1,200 employees who will be fired over the next six weeks. How might your impression of the CEO's statements be different from those of the rest of the workforce? Would you think that she was credible? Why?
Well, I'm with you. I probably wouldn't think she was very credible either. Uh, she was not trustworthy, and she didn't demonstrate honesty and character to the workforce. Um, the CEO's credibility would, would vary depending on who you are. If you're the HR manager or the vice president of operations, you probably don't think that she's very credible. However, the other people who listen to the address probably just heard what they wanted to hear, and they probably do think that she's credible. So hopefully that example illuminates to you how different folks can hear the same thing and come away with a very different point of view uh, with regard to whether or not the speaker is trustworthy or credible. So what is credibility? Credibility is basically uh, those three things. It's trustworthiness, uh, which is character. It's competence, uh, which is your ability to produce a truth. Are you uh, intellectual? Are you smart enough? Are you, you know, uh, educated enough to produce a truth? And uh, then it's dynamism. It's uh, are you dynamic? Do you have charisma? Are you likable? Are you someone that we want to be like? Are you someone that we should trust because we, we like, we have an affinity for? Basically, that's uh, the three things that credibility uh, is composed of, and if you can always remember those three variables and kind of safeguard against doing anything that damages those three variables, uh, your credibility will remain intact, and uh, you will always you know, have that to kind of hang your hat on as a public speaker. So, remember, credibility is perceptual. Uh, some, sometimes, uh, you know, the most interesting man in the world is not necessarily, uh, although he is very dynamic, uh, may not know more about fixing your motherboard uh, than someone you know from uh, the Geek Squad. Uh, however, someone uh, from the Geek Squad probably doesn't know as much about running with the bulls in Pamplona as the most interesting man in the world. So, uh, really, it's perceptual, it's situational. It depends on uh, your perspective, and it depends on uh, you know who the audience is and who the speaker is, and uh, it's something that the audience has to make up their mind about. All you can do as a speaker is put yourself out there as an expert, choose to speak about topics that you're familiar with and that you have a, a natural, you know, in, in kind of, you know, bred uh, association with and that you have, you know, a natural connection to. So speak about those topics that you are credible with and, uh, you know, do your best in speaking about them. If you'll safeguard your competence, your character, and your charisma, then you will always be credible with the audience. Uh, if you will you know, just do that and take care of the factors that keep me gaining attention, then you should be able to do uh, very well in most public speaking situations. Thank you very much. younger than the sun